Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, meeting of Tamworth Borough Council Cabinet on the 10th of October 2024. Um, can I remind members that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube? Um, can I also apologise for the sound and hope that it, it gets me through the meeting? Um, apologies, we've received apologies from Councillor Smith. Do we have any other apologies? No, we're all here. Um, you should have the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 16th of September in front of you. They're here for approval. Can I request a mover and a seconder? Seconder? All those in favour? Thank you. <laughs> Item three, declarations of interest. Uh, any of the committee members um, have anything they wish to declare? Thank you. Um, item four is question time and there are no questions this evening. So item five is matters are referred to the cabinet in accordance with the overview and scrutiny procedure rules. And we have an update from the chair of health and wellbeing committee to present recommendations from the updated armed forces covenant plan. And I'll hand over to Councillor Bain. Thank you, chair. And I hope I sound a bit better than you do. Really. Um, yeah, you've got the paper in front of you. I'll just quickly recap on, on how we've got to where we've got to. Uh, we reaffirmed in July of last year our commitment to the Armed Forces Covenant and, and the spirit behind that. And at that point, I think we'd agreed that Councillor Andrew Cooper was going to be our champion because as, an ex, as a veteran himself. But there was a constitutional obstacle to that happening. And in fact, uh, the Constitution says that a member of the Cabinet cannot be a champion. So we, we, we tried to deal with that and um, we, we took something to Cabinet on the, or Cabinet decided on the 20th of July um, that there would be delegated authority to the portfolio holder for entertainment, leisure and assistant director, I'm, I'm sorry he's not here tonight, Lewis Smith, uh, to oversee the associated work plan that went alongside um, the Armed Forces Covenant. There's no point in having an Armed Forces Covenant if you don't do something with it. So there had to be a work plan uh, to go alongside that. And that would, um, that would then generate a report on an annual basis to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. So that was agreed by Cabinet. Fast forward a year to earlier on, July, 18th of July, uh, we reconfirmed after discussion and research that the cabinet member, Lewis Smith, cannot actually be the champion. So that was confirmed for us. Um, but we also agreed that it was quite right that the Armed Forces Covenant should sit within Lewis Smith's, Councillor Smith's portfolio, um, and that he should be the member lead for Tamworth Borough Council. Um, the committee were also concerned, however, that Lewis Smith is not himself a veteran and that it might be good to have a member champion who was a veteran, but not a member of the cabinet. And that leads us to the recommendation that I've brought here today. Um, and before making the recommendation, I, I just point out that it's not a requirement to have a champion under the Armed Forces Covenant. We just felt it was a very strong signal to send out about our commitment to the Armed Forces Covenant and to the members of the Armed Forces who live in Tamworth. So the recommendation that we're, we're putting um, here today is that you consider the appointment of a non-political role, and champion I think must be non-political, or at least non-party political, for an armed forces champion whilst there are serving members who are veterans. If there are no veterans amongst the members, clearly we can't do it. But on the occasions that there are, um, uh, councillors who, who are veterans, then we should consider that to be a normal appointment. I think that's all I want to say at this point, Chair. Happy to take any questions on that. Thank you for that, Councillor Bain. Has anybody got any questions or um, statements they want to make on this? Am I looking for agreement for this, Tracy? And then we're doing it now, yeah? So we, we have um, Chris's recommendation before us then that we consider the appointment of this um, non-political armed forces champion. Is everyone in agreement? Do I need a mover and a seconder? Sorry. Mover, seconder. All those in favour? 
you've got that council of aim it's a no-brainer thank you for that <coughs> um, item six then is the nature declaration update and i'm going to hold hand over to the portfolio holder for environmental sustainability recycling and waste councillor foster not easy for you to say that anymore is it? <laughs> sorry yeah um, yeah thank you chair um, so, just as an introduction to this report, this report outlines the progress made on the Town Townworth Nature Recovery, Recovery Declaration since it was made on the 12th of December 2023, signalling Townworth's commitment to halting nature's decline. A Nature Recovery Declaration explains the steps we will take to support nature recovery and will continue to the countrywide and will contribute to the countrywide local nature recovery strategy being, being prepared by the Staffordshire County Council. I think members need to be aware that you know this this is uh, this is mostly led by Staffordshire County Council because obviously we don't really have a vast amount of um, area to um, to um, to work with, <clears throat> but we are very committed to it. Since our de declaration, we have my was made there have been further requirements by diversity consideration made by the council as part of the biodiversity duty arising from the environment act of 2021 the biodiversity duty outlines what steps local authorities should take towards nature recovery and is closely aligned with tamworth's nature recovery declaration but it also contains some Further requirements, such as mandatory diversity net gain for all non-exempt new developments. As part of this report, a draft biodiversity consideration is presented to the committee. Whilst much of the work towards nature recovery declaration is still at an early stage, several projects are underway, including in partnership with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, who we're working with closely, the development of a local nature recovery action plan for Tamworth, creating <clears throat> the creating of, of monitoring and management plans to improve the conditions of the local nature reserves, a project around creating local habitat banks and ensure 30% of Tamworth's Borough Council's green space is managed for nature and implementing a peat-free policy. A working group looking at nature, environment and biodiversity has been established to oversee the progress of this work, which is truly cross the direct route and once the, and once the consideration for approval, uh, can begin to work on the actions that will best meet each of these ob objectives. So really what we're looking for is members to approve the diverse biodiversity consideration and de endorse the progress and up updates provided. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Sarah? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really excited by this report and I absolutely will endorse it, but I just have a couple of questions when I'm thinking about some of the residents, um, not just in my ward, but kind of across town who I know contact a lot of us regarding trees. So I'm looking on page 18 where I read about tree planting and I really like this phrase, right tree, right place. Um, and we know that there are areas where, sadly, there can sometimes be the wrong tree in the wrong place, despite all those benefits which are self-evident even without this report, um, with road verges as well. And um, there are some areas of Bowhall that have not been <coughs> developed for a very long time. And <coughs> Council Clark was only showing me the other evening, if you look on Google Maps from a few years ago, how there's a very well-maintained um, road space and sort of green spaces versus now, where we know some of residents would struggle to get by because of just how kind of overgrown I guess the phrase is and yet that would also be a phenomenal habitat you know for wildlife so is there anything else you could tell us about how this policy would also work alongside making sure that people can travel safely in and around the area where there might be overgrown trees or road verges um, so on the tree planting issue, so in the nature declaration there is um, recognised that we need a tree policy and strategy um, so that we're not just planting whatever, wherever. Uh, but it also needs to take into account climate adaptation, so that's why it's about the right tree because we are going to get 
a change in weather conditions and weather patterns. So we're gonna have wetter winters and much hotter summers. So it's getting the right trees to cope with those environmental changes as well. And so that's really important. Um, in terms of grass verges, it is recognised that they are a, a really high source of biodiversity if they're not mown you know, on a regular basis and just left to grow. But it's caveated in the declaration, uh, not at the cost of highway safety, and that that has to be a priority and paramount when looking at uh, the mowing regime around some of these verges. So whilst biodiversity is important, highway safety in this instance would be considered probably more important. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, also, just to add what Anna said, it's about creating... So some of the conversations the officer working group has had is around what um, planting is in the grass verges as well. So things like clover, for example. Um, and one of the other pieces of work we're committed to through the Nature Declaration is also around um, exactly what you've said, um, Councillor Daniels, uh, explaining to... Um, our residents the importance of having different elements of nature so some areas being longer grass potentially and how that creates nature rich environments but also having the more um, traditional um, shorter grass in other areas so having the right um, grass cutting regimes in the right place um, so we are encouraging nature where we can and the richness of that um, nature is not uniform as we know um, and sometimes we we could potentially become, you know, uh, fixated on everything being really uniform, but it's about the right nature in the right places. And we're really fortunate, the fantastic nature reserve, local nature reserves we have in, in Tamworth and the access to green space, uh, given the urban density that we have. Um, and we work very closely with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, both on the planning side of things, but also on the uh, management and a fantastic array of volunteers who do a fantastic job working alongside the Wildlife Trust to help maintain those nature reserves as well. So they should be commended as well. Yeah, do you want to come back? Yeah, just, just following on from your question. Um, also, I mean, we do recognise the fact that a lot a lot of these trees <coughs> that you, you're mentioning are actually planted in the wrong place. And it's hindsight is a great thing, isn't it? And, we, you know, we have to work with what we've got. Um, the, you, you know, what we're trying to do is to make sure that the right trees go in the right places to give us the biodiversity that we require you know, as an authority. Um, and unfortunately, we just have to manage what we've got um, as proactively as, as we can. And we know that some of these trees are not, then you know, they're not in the right place. You know, they're making the paths um, difficult to walk along because the roots have spread and whatever. But that wasn't a consideration when those trees were planted. You know, nobody thought about it, and nobody thought that we'd be in a, you know, a climate. Um, where which is changing, you know, so quickly. So you know, hindsight is a great thing, but I, I think, you know, we, we I think we'll do it as much as we can with what we've got, but we we just have to manage it as proactively as we can. Thank you, and um, thank you to the officers for the work they've done on this. I was lucky enough to be told about all the the difference in the work that we're going to be doing, and. I think there is a bit around education and once again that word comes because when we start leaving some places unknown we are we're, we're going to get the questions aren't we so we need to get it out there and let people know that we're doing this for the right reasons but there is it, it, it's been really good to hear of the different things we can do and the fact that we're on the front foot with looking at those different plants that we need to, to be put in that are more sustainable and they're going to be better for the environment. So thank you very much for that. Um, are we happy to proceed or are there any more questions? Right, so um, you, you have the recommendations before. You can have a mover and a seconder. Mover and a seconder. Are all those in favour? Thank you. <laughs> So item seven is the social housing regulatory programme update and I'm going to hand over to Councillor Clark to yep, put this straight. Thank uh, I'm going to take the report as read but just start with um, that on regulatory compliance we aren't where we want to be um, at the moment but I, I believe that the steps are in place and the steps that we're taking um, have put us on the journey to compliance. Um, Self-referral was absolutely the right thing to do on this, being open and transparent 
on these matters is the only way that we're going to move forward and progress and get these things right. Um, and just on the recommendations, I'd just like to touch on recommendation four on the independent tenant advocate um, in saying that this is a big step in giving um, tenants another voice on their housing. Uh, and it's in it's absolutely in line with our commitment to be um, putting tenants at the heart of decision making and, and everything that we do. Um, so I'd just like to thank Tina for all of her work on this. I know she's worked incredibly hard. Um, and I endorse the recommendations and um, yeah, I'll move them. Thank you. Do I have any questions? Oh, I'm getting up very lightly. <laughs> Can I just say um, thank you for all the hard work that's gone into this. I know that we've had, as a cabinet, we've had regular updates on this as, it, as it's gone through. And we, we have been behind the process all the while and very, very pleased with how it's going. A um, lot of lessons to be learned from it. And we, we just need to make sure as an authority that we do learn those lessons. That's the thing. Um, can I have a mover then? You already moved it and a second of them. Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you. <clears throat> Item 8 is the update on the strategic leaseholder review and I'll go back to Ben for this one please. Thank you Chair. <coughs> I'll take the report as read again. Um, so I'd just like to start by thanking everyone that has Excuse contributed. Excuse me, sorry Councillor um, Clark, it should be the Staffordshire Leaders Board. Oh sorry. Sorry. So item seven then should be Staffordshire Leaders Board, which we are going to defer until the next meeting. Thank you. We are now going on to the update yeah, of the strategic leasehold review. Ben, <laughs> sorry about that. Take two. Um, so yeah, I would just th um, thank everyone who's contributed to this piece of work. Um, it's not done yet, but it feels like a, mi a milestone, particularly for the leaseholders with the, uh, the roofing issues. Uh, I think the key recommendation, and I said this last night at scrutiny, and um, that we want to that they want to focus on is, is recommendation number four, where we'll be re recommending remedial works rather than replacement. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to take any questions, but um, I'm going to be handing over to Sam as well. He's got some recommendations from last night's corporate scrutiny. Thank you, um, portfolio holder and chair. Um, so yes, we had the corporate scrutiny uh, meeting uh, last night. Um, we did go through the recommendations uh, laid out in the report uh, for Cabinet tonight. Um, there wasn't a, a so-called vote uh, on these recommendations um, because we realise obviously they are mainly for this executive um, committee tonight. Uh, but we did have a conversation on all of those. We did go through them. And there were two recommendations um, that uh, came from that. Uh, one of them was an amendment to a recommendation, which I'll, I'll get to. And uh, the other one is a wholly new recommendation as well. Um, I think what I'd like to do, if that's OK, is just go through the recommendations and just uh, describe the general feelings um, that were expressed. Uh, in corporate scrutiny. Um, so the first one, uh, there was a, a comment in the sense that uh, it sort of was a little bit, um, in terms of the objective of recommendation one, um, it wasn't completely clear and it, it was a bit sort of complicated in the wording. Um, when I uh, raised uh, that particular uh, note, I uh, I think that the response from the executive director was that the general uh, theme of uh, was that we were recommending um, what was laid out in the Campbell Tickell report. However, obviously the payment options and the payment plan around that um, couldn't at this time be be endorsed. And please tell me if I if I read that wrong. But that was the general tone. And if that is so. Um, that is absolutely fine because I absolutely realise and I think what was expressed was that the payment side of it is a complicated process and, and I would suggest needs further work. Um, so that was recommendation one. Um, also note on that one, um, there was a uh, recommendation that came from um, the 
August uh, corporate screening meeting, um, which simplified that um, as simply saying uh, that we would suggest recommending um, the recommendation, recommendations as laid out by Campbell Tickell. Uh, moving on to recommendation two, which was to um, endorse, um, cabinet endorse and reaffirm the recovery of sums related to leasehold, uh, leasehold service charge invoices in accordance with a corporate credit policy. Um, there was quite a bit of conversation on this um, because I made, I made the point that the credit policy, the corporate credit policy, didn't necessarily have to be brought in, I would suggest, uh, when we're talking about uh, a set criteria and a means testing way of working out, you know, potential uh, payment plans uh, in, in effect. So um, I also raised um, and, and the committee expressed um, concern um, that based on uh, information that we had in front of us, um, there would be a, a worry essentially of saying that we want to go necessarily straight to um, what would be chargeable invoices. Um, and uh, I raised certain uh, specific concerns, which were, uh, as an example, uh, emails I had received um, last year um, from TBC, from, uh, from the finance team. I'm certainly not going to say who, um, but there were concerns based on those comments. Uh, one comment was we don't have a set criteria and we will judge each case on its merit and take into account their general circumstances. Um, there's also, uh, we also have apparently a debt recovery document uh, in TBC, which um, I was able to look at, uh, where we talked about, uh, where, uh, apologies, it uh, mentions in that document, um, it is deemed, if it is deemed that they are unable to pay us in a short period of time, we would look to offer a 12 month payment plan in respect of these cases. So that is in the debt, in the, in the current debt recovery procedure, apparently. Um, so if this one links in very closely to the S20 notices, uh, which are part of that process. So I'll come back to this, I suppose, uh, when we, when we, when we, um, when I mention that particular recommendation. Um, so as it stands on that one, um, the comments expressed by the committee were of concern um, and also it's, I don't think it's reasonable to try and conflate what is essentially um, a recovery of sums only to the corporate credit policy. There are, there are other mechanisms at play and other uh, sets of criteria that come into that. Um, so there are concerns on recommendation two. Recommendation three approves the development of the service improvement plan that considers the time and resources required to implement the recommendation. Um, and attached to that was, of course, the service improvement plan. Members of the committee expressed um, concerns um, that um, the plan could actually be improved itself. Um, I suggested that it needed to be more robust and contain more actionable uh, data, including measures as well. Um, but it was uh, something that we had asked in the August corporate scrutiny meeting to come back to the committee uh, last night, and that obviously happened, so uh, that was appreciated. Um, moving on to uh, recommendation four, Cabinet approves the, recommend uh, the commencement of remedi remedial works in line with surveys that have been completed and would include commence commencement of consultations and the issuing of invoices upon com com completion. Um, this uh, did raise concerns with the committee because uh, going from what would be those works going straight to the issuing of invoices um, 
kind of is what happened before and what led to a lot of the contra controversy last time around. Um, and uh, I would suggest that those figures are checked and confirmed before any issuing of invoices. Um, so we did, um, we did make an amendment to that one. So we, we moved uh, a recommendation um, to amend recommendation four, um, and that was cabinet approve the process for remedial works based on the completed surveys and utilizing a QLTA approach. A detailed cost breakdown must be submitted to the next available corporate scrutiny committing, committee as a briefing note. Both these costs and the final invoices require approval from the portfolio holder for housing, homelessness and planning. So it just gives that, that check um, to make sure that those costs um, have been put together in a, in a sensible and certainly not outrageous way. Um, Okay, so moving to recommendation five. Cabinet approves the use of Campbell Tickell to assist in the development of the leaseholder policy. Um, that was not an issue, and in fact, we, um, we endorsed that one in the last uh, meeting of corporate scrutiny in August. Um, and moving to recommendation six, Cabinet approves the updated S20 notices produced by Campbell Tickell. That falls and links into the earlier recommendation regarding the um, payments and, and how those are made. Um, so what was, there was a bit of a, a balanced um, conversation around this one because while there was an expression to say that uh, there needs to be more of a visual display, display of a potential for, a, for example, a 12-month um, payment plan. Um, after much, to, much, com, much conversation on it, there was also a suggestion that at the very least, um, after uh, the uh, page of the invoice, um, or indeed on a covering letter, uh, there should straight away be um, information on there that allows the leaseholder to get in touch if they have concerns um, and potentially then uh, into, enter into a conversation where there is a uh, plan um, for a payment set up. Um, the, the goal here is not to have a situation where we have a leaseholder potentially very old and vulnerable and certainly uh, might be in a position where they're no longer working or certainly having a, a steady income to suddenly be um, exposed to an invoice asking for what could be upwards of £8,000, and I use that figure because it was quoted previously, um, for works that uh, then needs to be paid within uh, a single month. Um, so I would express that the options uh, and the help and support are made very, very clear um, to, the, to the leaseholder. Uh, just making sure that uh, yep. So one of the thing, one of the uh, co also uh, conversations was, was making sure that the new suite of letters are still as uh, are, are as customer friendly, should we say, as, as possible. Um, that also was uh, picked up in the service improvement plan as well. Um, so we have to make sure those letters uh, do um, do become a lot more, um, or a lot less harsh, should we say, but certainly as friendly as possible. Um, okay, so uh, recommendation seven, cabinet approves the responses to matters referred to cabinet set out in the table below. Um, in terms of the general report, um, it is what it is. Um, there were no sort of necessary major concerns there. Um, Number eight, Cabinet approves taking a test through the first tier tribunal. And of course, that was very much answered at the full council. Um, so uh, in the sense that there'll be obviously a, uh, a volunteer mechanism in place for that. So um, these holders have the opportunity 
to to do that if they so wish and um, I did remark the fact that uh, I think scrutiny worked on that occasion to uh, have that slight amendment um, so those are the the general uh, expressions and comments expressed in the committee last night at corporate scrutiny I'm happy to answer any questions and enter into any dialogue as you see fit No, thank you. Sure question, sir. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing those recommendations for us to consider. Uh, I'm just going to go with them as they are. I know there was a lot there uh, about about the meeting last night, so just tackling them as I've got them in front of me. Uh, on the f the amendments, that's the first one. On um, cabinet approved the process for remedial works based on the completed surveys utilising the QLTA. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that's already that already takes place. That already happens. And um, on the second part of that amendment um, about invoices being approved by myself, in my opinion, this is not the role of the portfolio holder. Uh, and actually, I, I trust the officers to see this through. That's, I'm comfortable doing that. Um, I trust them to do that. So on this occasion, I won't be recommending that this amendment goes through. Uh, on, the, on the additional recommendation from corporate scrutiny, we, um, we have the corporate credit policy. Um, and I think it, it wouldn't be right to have a different policy for a, for, a different, for a separate group of people. So on this occasion, I won't be recommending that this goes through either. I'll be recommending that we, uh, I'll be endorsing, sorry, that we um, take forward the original eight recommendations from the initial report from myself. But thank you for taking the time to make those recommendations. If I may come back. Um, I'd ask you if, you, if you can, to take a slight step back uh, I understand that, of course, TBC officers will be um, expressing their opinion, and that's absolutely right. But I would ask you to take a slight step back into what we're actually saying here. Um, if I can come back to the to the second recommendation, um, I think there's been an, a slight attempt, not that I'm certainly accusing anyone, to try and conflate this uh, this credit policy which went through Cabinet uh, last year, with a very simple and basic acknowledgement to say that based on uh, a selection of evidence, um, we don't really have a robust criteria um, and uh, a set statement of means to actually really deal with the issue of payment. As it stands at the moment, um, based on um, the current um, information that I've received based on what has happened historically over the years, based on also the uh, Campbell Tickell draft repayment options policy, which they've put together, which by the way uh, expressed um, a selection of recommendations in itself. Um, the loan part to that, which has already been um, massively um, brought to light is only one component of that overall repayment options policy. Um, there's some uh, extremely um, good points in the uh, repayment options policy that they've actually put together, um, which isn't particularly controversial. I would ask that if you haven't seen that, by the way, I would ask you to have a look at that in more detail, because at the time uh, it was uh, tended to be uh, put in a corner not to be seen against, and it certainly hasn't been uploaded at any point onto ModGov as an appendixed item uh, so far, which is interesting in itself. So I'm not talking about uh, deviating from our credit policy uh, that went through Cabinet. I'm just simply asking that we review and re revise um, the payment uh, criteria and statement of means that currently exist to make sure it's it's robust and it's fair and consistent because as we have currently seen over the couple of years and what has come out of the CT report that has not been the case so as far as I'm aware on the um, the corporate payment uh, the corporate credit policy if in this instance a leaseholder was, una was unable to pay they would be able to and it will be on the covering letter that will be from myself they'll be able to get in touch with the council and we'll be able to have arrangements that are suitable to their circumstances um so i i'm, I'm still i'm still in the area of, of rejecting that uh, uh, that recommendation 
if you wanted to bring the corporate pay policy, the corporate credit policy to corporate scrutiny, that's well within your gift. But I think for this particular item, getting this through, um, I think it's the right thing to do to go with the original eight recommendations based on the initial report. Sorry, can I just bring Councillor Daniels in? Just wait. Thank you. Um, so I want to begin with a thank you because this is a really robust piece of work that you have brought to us based on the work from last night and based on many, many months worth of work. And um, I was interested in this teacher hat on with um, a word that you used earlier about outrageous um, to describe previous sums. And if I think back to when I became a counsellor, I cannot possibly envisage this level of detail to think about a group of people whom we support to make sure that every possible granular detail has been considered. So I want to say thank you to that. There are people in the audience who I know have been very helpful with the case of that and everyone with this piece of work. But I have to come back to the fact that we have had so much scrutiny over it and trust that the people who work with us are going to make sure that if anyone was in a sense of vulnerability, they would have their cases fully considered in an expertise that they have that I don't. You know yourself that one of the things that we considered would be full roof replacement. Every roof is going to need to be done at some point, but we said that's not going to be the case because we must consider what people are able to afford. And if that's our baseline, then that's also going to translate into the ways in which some are recovered and we'll try and help people to pay in an appropriate manner. Yeah, if I may just come back in, I'll just make one um, last comment, possible question on the on the second recommendation is um and again i would uh i would ask and implore that you take a step back look at the last you know not just the last year but the last few years and look at the ct report we know there has been failings we know that there has been uh huge concerns in in process uh, admittedly nothing has uh, broken the law and that's fine um but there has been uh, huge amounts of uh, distress caused by uh, a process that has been um, not uh, certainly as well oiled as it should be. Um, and that's really what that second, re second recommendation is doing. It's simply saying to look at the information uh, that we have, which I have certain amounts um, from the finance team over the last year or so and simply look at uh, the possibility of, of review and re uh, re revise. Um, surely we want to make sure uh, not just for this but also going forward in terms of the leaseholder policy which of course will be formulated I'm assuming over the course of the year. Surely in a way you would be wanting to look at quite a major component um, of this whole um, strategy review, which is the matter of how we go about um, working out how people are going to pay, working out their situations, their vulnerability. Sure, you want to leave that as it currently is. Uh, you, you, you are happy with that. I would be very concerned about that. I think this is one of the top uh, five issues as part of the overall strategy that absolutely needs some serious um, attention and um, further work to be done with. So that would be my comment on um, recommendation two. Uh, you don't have to come back, it's not a question, but um, I would implore that you simply move and um, carry that because uh, I don't believe it's controversial. I honestly just think it's literally just read what it is. It's review and revise the payment plan criteria. It's nothing, I'm not talking about the corporate credit policy of 2023, which passed cabinet. I'm not talking about that. If it said that, fair enough. I would be uh, on your side because you're trying to balance the interests of all sides. And I totally understand that would be massively controversial. Um, but hey, uh, recommendation one is also bizarre in my view that you're not willing to support it. Um, now, the utilization of the QLTA, you might be thinking what that's all about. That's obviously a set process which incorporates the S20 process. Uh, it also means that you're entering into uh, what is an agreement post 12 months. Um, and there's a whole host of what I would suggest are sort of 
protections really actually um, for the for the relevant leaseholder um, so that first part is yes you say it's already in existence and that may well be but actually just putting it in writing is quite good um, because there is by the way the option of not having a QLTA it could be something that whereby the works are going to be done far far much quicker in a hurry not using necessarily a a proper set, a robust process, and um, then suddenly asking it, uh, leaseholders for amounts of money which um, they might at that particular point struggle with. So it's not a particularly controversial first part to that first recommendation. And in terms of the detailed cost breakdown, um, well, I believe the uh, executive director actually said that the breakdown already exists to some extent. I think the word estimated was used um, in the committee last night um, so that shouldn't be too much of a hassle uh, i would suggest that why wasn't it actually just brought to uh, the committee last night if it was already in existence because clearly over the course of the year that that particular issue of breakdown of costs has been massively pertinent we all know that um, so yeah so these costs and the final invoices require approval from the portfolio holder for housing um, homelessness and planning yourself why not? I mean, if we're talking about the current set of leaseholders, which is what this strategy encompasses, we're not talking about hundreds of individuals. We're talking about, you know how many there are. There's not a huge amount. It wouldn't be that difficult just to have a look um, and green light it. Otherwise, you're literally putting your trust in officers to suddenly come up with an amount of money um, which they feel fit uh, using a whole bunch of obviously metrics as part of the S20 process and you're simply saying that's okay I would suggest that you might want to take a, a second look and, and ensure that you're you're okay with that yeah thanks for those statements on the the second point you mentioned I won't be like just blindly saying crack on I will be working closely with officers um, but yeah I do, I do trust the officers that I work with they do incredible work and they work really hard um, so yeah, I, I do trust them, and it's not it's not right for me to blur the line between officer and portfolio holder, and that's why I don't agree with this this recommendation. I won't be pushing forward with it. Thank you. Can I just say um, there's been so much work that has already gone on with this, and I'm I'm really pleased with the way we've we've got to. When, when we think about where we were 12 months ago and how awful the situation was for everybody. The idea that people will be getting invoices out of the blue, I, I don't quite understand because people will be expecting an invoice now for the repair on their roof, which is what the leaseholders wanted. They wanted their roofs repaired. They've always known that there would be a cost to that and that they would be getting an invoice for it. Um, I, I really have an issue with us having a separate um, payment policy for one set of people, we need to have a corporate policy that we adhere to. We can't keep having lots of different policies that will never work. So I, I would, um, I am just in favour of taking these recommendations as they are. Sarah, did you want to come in? Um, <coughs> I do, and you know, the care that you're putting into this, like, please note me, and you're fighting such a good fight for the people of our town. And I know we've discussed this in the past in meetings and without the idea of, you know, you put politics aside, what are the policies, what are the ideas? But as you said to yourself, this is a small group of people. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that I just heard and that our officers and us as their ward council to be remiss not to give them the best support we possibly can to say this is who you contact this is the process they will work with you we're not trying to give you you know anything out of the blue final comment because i just wanted to clarify uh, just one part to what i said before which was um and by the way you know, I respect your decision. I might not agree with it, but that's your decision to make. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of the characters and of, of officers in TBC um, and their intentions, I have no issue with. Um, and I certainly have a huge level of trust with, um, with officers as well. Um, I just want to make sure that when I say what I said before, it's not that it's we're talking about are we making sure that there is a level of competence 
um, in the actions that are taken. And if we blindly put all faith in um, those actions that are being taken, I can um, suggest that we're going to go um, back to a level that we were potentially a couple of years ago. So I would just add um, that caution to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Sam. I'd, I would just go back to what I said earlier about how big a piece of work this has been. Um, it, and so many recommendations have come out of it. We've got all that stuff around the tone of the letters, the way the letters have done. We, we now have, a, to my mind, we have a completely different system where we're going to be dealing with this kind of issue. And as we go forward with other projects like this, we will be working in a different way. We won't go back to that way that we, we did it before. We will make sure that the recommendations that are coming through are followed through. Um, did you want to <laughs> move? Yeah, so just to be clear, I'm moving the eight recommendations from um, the report titled Update on Strategic Leasehold Review, the one from myself. Um, I won't be moving the corporate screening recommendations at this time. Sorry, uh, yeah, I need to find the paper now and find out. We're on to item 10. Yes. Um, <coughs> right. Exclusion of the press and public. Um, that members of the press and public be now excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following items on the ground that the business involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as detailed in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972, as amended. Do I have a mover and a seconder? All those in favour? Thank you. 